Welcome to the latest episode of Just Getting Started. This is episode nine, if you're scoring at home. Uh, I am your humble host, Rich Eisen, and it's NFL Draft Week. It's NFL Draft Week, and when I started this podcast, um, I thought to myself, you know what, I need to make sure that I differentiate this show, uh, having as many people on to tell their inspiring, or hopefully inspiring to you, uh, origin stories from the world of entertainment and business and broadcasting. Um, and uh, I just said, you know what? Sometimes I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna purposely try and stay away from my supposed wheelhouse of sports. Um, there are some times, though, where the guest is just gonna come from the world of sports. And last week, Rex Chapman was so dynamite. And yes, he is from the world of sports. Although many people know him now from the world of social media and what he has built himself into on that platform uh, on Twitter. Um, and also his story, uh, if you didn't hear it, you got to go download it uh, because it was inspiring from the point of view of him battling addiction much of his uh, adult life and how he has just gotten started on a, a new way of doing things. And um, so you need to download that. So Rex, yes, is from the the world of sports, but it is NFL Draft Week. And uh, on the day that we are dropping, if you will, uh, Wednesdays is when we are dropping every episode of Just Getting Started. It'll be the day before the NFL Draft. And I'll be sitting in the chair, the host chair um, of NFL Network for 17th NFL Draft. And I figured let's get the origin story of somebody who uh, was drafted in the last round of his NFL Draft. And has not only uh, not only went on to a, uh, a decorated career at his position, but has started something new, and just got started on something that has grown and blossomed into one of broadcasting's greatest success stories. And what he has become is something uh, to behold with the uh, millions of his followers every day across his social media and YouTube platforms, his show on YouTube every day from 12 to three Eastern that does go up against mine every single day on Westwood one and Peacock and Odyssey and Sirius XM. I have to get the plug in since, you know, he's coming on this show. He's Pat McAfee. He's highly uh, popular. He is hilarious. And he is one of the hardest workers that I know in this business. That is a fact. So he's got a great story to tell about how he got involved in football and a great story and how he left football to get started on his highly successful broadcasting career. So let's just get started with Pat McAfee. There's very few uh, people in the business that uh, I get to say that I uh, covered as a National Football League uh, player and then uh, have now um, come to say that I'm a competitor uh, with him and pleased to say both and that I adore him and I love everything that he's done with his career and he is none other than Pat McAfee here on Just Getting Started. How are you, Pat? Rich, it's an honor to join you here. I saw that you were starting this up. I saw the big name guests that were out there, just like you started the punters or people to movement. I mean, you've always been in my corner. I'm very, very thankful for the opportunity. I don't think we're competitors, Rich. No. I don't think we're competitors at all. No, you know what, Pat? Uh, I, honestly, we're on at the same time. And usually in the business, uh, from what I've, 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 I've had people like literally – shut it down just because of that stuff. And I will never, I made a promise. I would never be that person. And you, what you have done with your career, dude, is I've, I've said this to you. Honestly, I've said this to you many times off the air and I'll say it here on this pod. It is beyond impressive what you have done with your career and what you are doing and how much bigger you are getting with each passing day. And you are, you're, you're an absolute model to follow in this business it's a fact well it seems like that's a bit much because it is the people like you the people like dan the people that are in the daily sports grind and have been for a long time who are the model that i get to follow and i think 
the way people consume their content now, I don't think it matters what time you're on. It's just that you're on and that you're able to create content. So that's why I don't view you ever as competition or anybody because I think the way people consume content now, it's so different. There's enough to go around and especially uh, I would never want to view you as competition because you're such a monster in the game and you've always been so nice to me, which I'm very grateful for. Even before anybody knew about me, you've always been very nice. So I appreciate that. I do hope more NFL guys and NBA guys and everything do potentially, you know, uh, do what I was able to do because there's a lot more people that are a lot, have a lot more talent than I do. And hopefully it's just a chance to showcase what's what's possible if you just kind of go for it. Well, Rich. the deal is with this, Pat, is that it's it's an origin podcast, you know, and about where you just got started and everything like that. And so I, I wanted, like, you were literally my first choice for NFL Draft Week. Because out of all the stories that I have been able to hear on my show over the last seven years of doing my show and the podcast before it that you were on, the 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 story you tell about how you got started and getting basically on the radar screen of Bill Polian is easily one of my favorite origin stories that I've been able to have. And I really want to give you the floor on that for NFL Draft Week as we are getting ready for people to have their dreams realized in the NFL draft, Pat. Yeah, and I think I appreciate that. And obviously you'll do a great job with the draft coverage and I can't wait to watch it every single year. And there's a lot of dreams that come true, you know, and there's people that really look forward to draft weekend and draft night because, you know, this is years and years and years and years of hard work, things that people have never seen happen in the, you know, the 5 a.m. lifts, the cardio in the morning, like a lot of people's dreams coming true. And everybody just assumes that draft weekend is a blast. For me, it was almost a complete nightmare. I, I mean, just we're talking we're talking drunk, miserable last day of the draft. Seventh round is just ticking away. The Dallas Cowboys told me they were going to draft me. They draft somebody else in the fourth round. Wow. I'm sitting on a golf course with my family waiting for the call from Jerry Jones, basically. So our day was, you know, we're golfing, having a blast. There's a lot of booze on the course. We'll wait until we get the call from the Cowboys, and we'll just go ahead and turn this thing up a little bit. We knew the first night I wasn't going to get drafted, second night I wasn't going to get drafted. So we obviously celebrated being a Cowboy those first two nights. And then the third day, whenever back in the day, whenever it was the third day for, yeah. like, I think – fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh, or fifth, sixth, and seventh, or whatever, that was the day that I was going to get drafted to be a Cowboy. So then while we're on the golf course, my mom, who's normally a pretty reserved person, she's in the golf cart, and she's waiting for the party, you know, and she's the one that's updating everybody with her phone, and she actually goes, uh, and I don't know if you're allowed to use she actually goes, oh, fuck. Like, she goes, she actually says that, right? And my mom would never do that, okay? So she would not do that. She's she's normally pretty quiet or whatever. So my dad, who I think you know pretty well at this yeah. point, you've heard about, my dad goes back there, and he goes, oh, no, right? And my dad goes, oh, the Cowboys drafted another guy. Let's get out of here. So we literally just leave the golf course. I think we're on, like, hole 11 or 12 maybe to go back home. And we had no other conversations with anybody, really, that told me they were going to draft me. So – like, aside from the Cowboys, I was trying to figure out what plan B was. I wasn't invited to the Combine. Uh, I, I kicked in the Senior Bowl, but nobody was really talking to me. The Cowboys were really the only people that were talking to me. The Colts did a couple workouts, but they never told me, like, hey, we're going to draft you or whatever. Then when I get drafted, pick 222 via a trade with Philadelphia. By that point, our entire house, okay, the entire neighborhood, drunk, miserable, telling stories about how the good old days when I used to kick for West Virginia, we thought like literally this was over. We thought, okay, we're completely screwed at this point. Get a call from a 317 number, pick 222. I answer, uh, hello, you know, and it gets real loud. It gets real loud. And it's it's Bill Polian talking to me. And Bill Polian's like, hey, we just traded with the Eagles. Uh, we can't wait for you to be a Colt. And at that point, I think I'm potentially – competing with Adam Vinatieri for the kicking position, for the kicking position, okay? So I'm like, long road ahead of me here. I, I don't know how this is going to go. And then he goes, like, we're drafting you to punt. And nobody really they, – they had me work out as a punter, and I thought it was always, like, kick field goals. Can you also punt if you have to? Because in college, we did the rugby rollout punt. So I would just catch the snap, sprint to my right, kick as hard as I can and just hope it would roll. Very different than the NFL. Very different. So nobody was like, hey, you'll be a punter. So when Bill 
drafted me goes to punt. It was like a, almost like a, oh God. And then at that point, the TV had caught up to the news in the house went from drunk and miserable to lit and ecstatic. We all think I'm going to kick field goals for the Indianapolis Colts. They're yelling. The whole house is pumped. The whole town is pumped. And uh, Bill Pullian's assistant basically goes like, uh, all right, I'm going to run through some numbers. What number do you want? I'm like, what? She's like, what number do you want? She goes, one's available. I was like, good, good. That's good. And she's like, okay, what flight? What flight do you want to come out here next week for the rookie thing? She's like, there's one at like 5.30 a.m. or whatever. I'm like, that's good. That's good. Like people are screaming. So it kind of just like came to be a hell of a party. Obviously, my entire town of Plum uh, all kind of met at this Italian joint. And we all just kind of had a a great time. But it wasn't until the next morning we realized like, okay, now I got to learn how to fucking punt. You know what I mean? Like, so now like we, we celebrated, you know, we celebrated it. Uh, but then we had to make it happen. And I was bad for a long time. I was very thankful for Bill Polian, who, and I quote said, I think you're athletic enough to figure it out. It's like, yeah, we're going to find out if you deserve that gold jacket or not, Bill. I guess we're going to find out. So draft day was insane. It was almost miserable. It became a dream come true. But there's a lot of people out there that have no clue what's going to happen draft weekend. I love that story, man. But I think it's only surpassed by you putting a tape together. Back in the day, you put like a resume reel together to get on the radar screen for colleges, right? Oh, uh, yeah. And we, we, Give me that story. Yeah, my, Tim McAfee. So Give me that in one. high school, I was, I was a soccer player. In yeah. high school, I was a soccer player. Okay. So I was pretty good soccer player, by the way. Like, you know, like uh, played overseas a few times, took some trips overseas. There was a lot, a lot more schools. We're talking like 10 to 12X, maybe 15X looking at me for soccer than for football. So I always had a strong leg though. The first time I kicked the football, I kicked like a 60 yard field goal or whatever. It was like, whenever we were, uh, we had soccer practice and there was a kicking camp on the field right before us. And they were like kicking or whatever. And I was like, Hey, let me see one of those footballs nerds. Like, like almost like making fun of the kickers because in Pittsburgh, massive football town. So I played a lot of football, never kicked though. You know, it was like street football and I played soccer. My entire life was focused on soccer. So I kick a ball, it travels very far. And it's a 60-yard field goal goes through. The guy running the camp, he used to kick in college, and he was like, hey, hey, you should you should think about doing this. You know, like I won the punt pass and kick a few years before that, but that's not field goal kicking. That's really just like you got to do what you got to do. And I did it because my mom kind of forced me to do it so we'd get some free tickets to a Steelers game because we couldn't get down to a game or whatever. So I won the national championship there. I continued to play soccer. But then when I started focusing on kicking football – Nobody really knew about our high school in football. Nobody. There's not a lot of, like, it's not a D1 factory. Our soccer team, good. The football team, not so good. So we actually had people that would come to games, and I wouldn't go to practice all week. I would just walk in, like, with the fans on Friday. So, like, that was literally my only interaction. No, I barely knew how to put on the pads, like classic movie. I didn't know what the fuck to do with the pads. And then I'd walk in with the fans, and then it was like the locals – would literally watch like, oh, we got a big ball kicking guy for us, and he's our soccer player. So people would come watch me just pound these kickoffs. Like, I would just hit kickoffs through the end zone. I'd hit field goals. I don't think I missed in high school. And it was just one of these things where there wasn't a lot of recruiting that was going on, though. And my parents and I had to have a full conversation. It was like, okay, so academically, life's probably not going to work for me, right? I'm probably I'm probably not going to be a doctor, okay? Uh, probably not going to be a lawyer. That's a lot of reading. Probably not going to get into that. So if, if I really wanted to make anything, which I had dreams of making it ever since I was a kid, it, I was very ambitious, have been for a long time. Um, you know, dad, a truck driver, mom, a secretary, but I always dreamt of like, you know, the big stage, whatever it may be. So we had, to, we had to have a real conversation. It was like, if you want to get rich playing soccer, you got to go to Europe. But if you want to get rich kicking balls you, right here in America, you can do that for football. And you don't have to run like nine miles, you know? So it's like, what do we want to do here? We made a business decision. A lot of things would have to work out, obviously, for me to make it to the NFL. But I would like to be a professional football kicker as opposed to a professional soccer player. Because if I want to get filthy rich, that's in America as opposed to Europe. A lot of things are going to have to happen, but at least we have our mindset right. right. So my dad started recording my kicks because nobody knew I existed, really. It wasn't like our high school was out promoting like, oh, we got a guy – who's 17 years old, kicking 70-yard field goals. So it was like my dad put together these tapes. I dropped them off at West Virginia University at Pitt. Penn State, was. uh, they were sending me letters with my face on a uniform. They're like, oh, you're going to be a Nittany Lion. You're going to be a Nittany Lion. And then uh, 
Mike McQuarrie told me I wasn't Penn State material. Yes, that Mike McQuarrie told me I wasn't Penn State material. They offer Kevin Kelly. And it wasn't until like a month before signing day that I went down to that kicking camp uh, in Florida that I got real lucky to go to. And uh, I kicked like a 65-yard field goal, missed a 70-yard field goal wide right. And the next morning, West Virginia offered me and a couple other schools. And that's kind of all she wrote. But my life is just a series of ridiculously lucky events, including getting a chance to go on your podcast way back in the day before they gave you a daily show. Yeah. It all kind of leads to each other. You know what I mean, Rich? I do know what you mean. It really is amazing. And then the number of times that you could give up and you just say, screw it, I'm just going to keep doing it and doing it and doing it until you finally get there. What would that conversation to Jerry Jones have been like if he had called you? On the golf course, you guys were all lit. Fourth round. No, we weren't you, lit. You were not we lit. Weren't lit. We're, okay. No, we're all hung over. We're all <laughs> incredibly hung over. But we were, we were saving. You know, we were saving the celebration for yeah. when he called. You know, whenever. Hey, listen, McAfee. I, you know, I, we were very pumped up for it. We had. I was gonna be. A, I was gonna be on America's team. Yeah, I was gonna be on America's team. It was a big celebration. Also in Pittsburgh, you know, my dad hated the Cowboys, so. For that, like, two days leading up to the draft, my dad was coming around, you know, like, kid's going to have a star on his helmet, I guess. Okay, here we go. And then, lo and behold, I don't get drafted. All hell breaks loose, and then Bill Polian showcases his big football brains and says, hey, I want you to play another position. It's going to work out. I'm like, thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill Polian. <laughs> Jesus. Whose, whose job was it to tell Peyton Manning that his field position was in uh, the hands of a guy who didn't really punt, was a kicker? I mean, whose job was that? Do you think, Pat? Well, Peyton, Peyton Manning, you know, he's hoping to never see me anyways. Like, that's kind of, you know, and, and by the way, that never happened. There was a couple times, I guess, with Hunter Smith where he didn't even go on the field to punt. I, I had, like, a couple games with one punt or whatever because Peyton Manning's unbelievable. But <laughs> as an Indianapolis Colt punter, I'll tell you this, especially with Peyton Manning as quarterback, when the offense doesn't get a first down, ain't nobody happy that you're coming on the field. The fans are booing you. Peyton's pissed. I mean, it is. It is not a desirable, you know what I mean? It's not a desirable thing. But the, I, and I think I've told you this story before. Uh, Bill Polian asked me while we we're going through the process. I, I don't remember if it was, yeah, it was Bill that asked me. And it was in a call during one of these workouts or whatever. And he just, it was kind of just like a throwaway question that didn't really lead me in anything. He was like, have you ever held before or whatever? And I was like, oh, all the time, you know, because, because I kicked in college. So, Obviously, I kicked and punted, so I couldn't have held for myself. So he asked me, like, have you ever held before? I'm like, oh, all the time, Bill, you know, like, love it. It's like, it's something I enjoy doing. And then I get drafted, and Vinatieri knew of me because the, uh, like, the physical trainers and the athletic training staff at Indianapolis all went to West Virginia. So they're all, like, big West Virginia Mountaineers fans. So they knew me. Vinatieri knew me via them. And Vinny knew that I had kicked in college, so literally – the day after that big celebration, I am very hungover, chugging Pedialyte, trying to learn how to punt. And I get a call from the GOAT. And he's like, have you ever held before? And I was like, uh, about that. Uh, I have never, I have never, I've never held. So he sent me, he sent me to Ken Walter's house. Oh, Ken Walter was his holder in New England. No. He sent me to Ken Walter's house in North Carolina for like a holding boot camp that next week. Like, he was like, hey, listen, just because you lied, you're not ruining my career. But that was something, I think, that could have set us off on the wrong foot and instead it tightened us in the long run. But, yeah, it was all – all hell broke loose, Rich. It was a nightmare. So, just to recap, you thought you'd be drafted in the fourth round by the Cowboys. You went all the way into the seventh. At the very end, the uh, Colts traded to come get you. You had never really punted much before at all. Bill Polian says, you're now our punter. And you told him throughout the whole process that, of course, you love holding. You never held. And now you're Adam Vinatieri's holder and Peyton Manning's punter. And that's the way you were born into the NFL. And thus, eventually, for the brand, was born through that, Pat McAfee. And and um, just months later, kicking off a Super Bowl. <laughs> what a joke. <laughs> what an absolute joke, dude. That's what I'm saying, Rich. Like. <laughs> My life is so, so dumb. It makes no sense. I'm very lucky to be be obviously here and doing it, but it makes no sense at all. And, and by the way, Peyton and Vinny, if it wasn't for them, I don't think I have the career that I have either. They kind of 
you know, they were kind of like, hey, this is how you got to operate. This isn't Morgantown, West Virginia anymore. Okay, you're a professional athlete now. And it took me a little bit to learn there, but I, I owe them a lot to get to be where I was, you know? So you got a good, before we get to the here and now, you got a good Peyton story, good Vinatieri story, a little bit of both. You got one uh, that's your favorite? To tell so my mm-hmm. my favorite the, my favorite Peyton one has been just overexposed now at this point it's the red 18 story just because it was at a casino like Peyton took me on this golf trip I was should have never got invited to go on you know and then he ends up walking past me telling me to bet on red 18 and everybody in the French Lick Indiana area obviously saw Peyton walking through the casino because to get where we were to his room he had to walk the floor of the casino and Peyton's not like, you know, hard to find, yeah, let no, alone in Indiana. He's you know big. what I mean? So yeah. so that was a big moment because just how the whole casino felt because of me with Peyton walking by telling me. It was just like, a, that's obviously my favorite moment. But like a Vinatieri Peyton story that not a, a lot of people know about is, so when you go to training camp, we did training camp in Terre Haute, Indiana at um, – they're the engineers. I forget the name of the school. Yeah, it's a small I school. The... I forget it too, but I know what you're talking about. It's just, you're right. It's it... it's left of the city. What's that? Uh, the engineers. It's a really smart school. She, my wife is from here. She has no idea what it is either. It's, it was, anyways, it was a nice school. Very nice school there. The engineers, a lot of very smart humans there. But that's where we had training camp. It's like an hour and a half away from Indianapolis. Mm-hmm. And the first weekend or second weekend of training camp, my rookie year, uh they said hey everybody's allowed to go home for a night just come back tomorrow like 7 30 team meeting or whatever go home so a lot of people went back to the city a lot of the rookies went back to the hotel that we had in indianapolis to kind of take the night off and i didn't really have anywhere to go so i just stayed out there and what i realized was uh peyton stayed adam vinatieri stayed it felt like all of the ogs stayed out there and were like yeah we're not going home for the night or whatever so adam vinatieri asked me that first weekend uh, he was like, so you stuck around? I'm like, uh, yeah, I'm sticking around. He's like, cool. Can you drive me somewhere later? So they like, they asked me to be like their driver or whatever. Right. Yeah. So I drive a car into town. There's a couple, you know, adult establishments there. It's like early. We're going to do like, uh, not, not adult ballets. I'm talking like drinks. You know what I mean? <laughs> drinking. Yeah. I'm talking like drinking Ballet. places. There's no adult, yes. there's no adult ballets out there, but yes, sir. So Anderson so University, I'm, I think, is what it's called. Anderson. No, University. Anderson. No. Anderson is Anderson's a different one. It's the one before Anderson. The Franklin before College Anderson. is that what that is too? I don't know. No, that's in the area. I this is bad. I should know this, but okay. anyways. So we go into town, and I'm driving them. You know, in like Peyton's in the car, Vinny's in the car. There's a couple other guys in the car. I'm fresh out of Morgantown, West Virginia. I'm like, this is the most ridiculous life of all time. I don't even know how to punt yet. First week of training camp. Rose so I Holman, them. by the way. Rose Holman. There you go. Rose Holman, Institute of Technology. There, there it is. Go. Very good. That was Lou Pellegrino chiming in via text. I didn't mean to interrupt, but I just wanted to get hey, that out of your skull. So. Hey, shout out, Lou. Not to be confused with the South Harmon Institute of Technology. The Rose Holman <laughs> Institute of Technology is all engineers. You know, it's all engineers. Very nice school. But I was only there for one year at training camp. But we go into town or whatever, and I'm driving the car, yeah. you know, that has, like, legends in it. I'm like, what the – what is going on, you know? So I get there, and there's, like, a, a an area of the bar that's kind of blocked off because a couple of the boys are going to go there, you know, and, and Peyton's going there, obviously, and Vinny's going there. So, you know, they, they wanted to treat them, treat them nice to have a little night uh, of drinking some beers or whatever and kind of be relaxed in their own time. So we go up there and I'm sitting like in the corner at the bar though. Like I'm just kind of hanging out, letting them do their thing. And uh, Vinatieri comes over and he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, ah, I don't want to, you know, interrupt whatever you guys got going on. He's like, no, 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 come over or whatever. I'm like, cool. So I go over there and they put a beer in front of me or whatever. Okay. They put a beer in front of me. I'm like, no, 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 I'm driving. You know what I mean? Like I'm not, I'm not, you guys kind of do your thing. That's what I'm here for, you know? And I thought it was a test. Like mm. I thought they were testing me or whatever. And I was like, I'm not going to fuck this up. Okay. I'm just driving. <laughs> So they're like, no, you're not driving. They took the keys. They're like, hey, come have a good time or whatever. So I used to have a pretty good party trick where I could chug beers very fast. Okay. So like very, very, very fast. Like ziggy zoggy, ziggy zoggy, oi, oi, oi type fast from <laughs> like I used to be able to delete beers. Okay. Not anymore. I had to retire it, but I used to be able to delete beers. So they had this beer right in front of me. And they're like, no, no, you can drink for real. And I kind of like give the keys over and I'm like, is this a test? They're like, no, no, no. And I just. I just, 
I just make it disappear, right? And then immediately there's a captivated audience, you know? It's like, oh, dancing monkey here. Is that real? Is that, and that's kind of how, like, that's kind of how my entire relationship, you know, kind of grew. I, I, I feel like Vinny and Peyton saw me as like, uh, in others that were there. I mean, there was offensive linemen there, linebackers, all the OGs, the team that had really been there for like, Ten, the winningest decade in NFL history, they were all kind of there. And I think that moment was quite an icebreaker. And it was from that moment on where they were like, hey, you're okay with us, bud. And they were pulling for me. They didn't know if I could figure out how to punt, but they were definitely pulling for me. And uh, I'm very, very thankful. For that. Today's episode of Just Getting Started is sponsored by Geico. Do you own or rent your home? Sure you do. And I bet it can be hard work. You know it's easy? Bundling policies with Geico. GEICO makes it easy to bundle your homeowner's or renter's insurance along with your auto policy. It's a good thing, too, because you already have so much to do around your home. Go to GEICO.com, get a quote, and see how much you could save. It's GEICO easy. Visit GEICO.com today. That's GEICO.com. Well, let's get to the here and now. Um, I remember when you said you're no longer going to punt, but you're going to start doing uh comedy and also i guess start what you're doing right now pat i remember that and i remember a lot of people thinking what a lot of people said to me when i when i left espn to go to nfl network which is what the hell are you thinking and uh, i'm sure you heard that a lot i'm sure you heard that a hell of a lot and i'm wondering if um that process as, as the question that I got it when I joined NFL Network, it literally informs me like a Brady chip, if you will, on my shoulder every day I do something. If that's if that's the same for you, I wonder. I mean, by the way, when you went to NFL Network, first ever hire, I do believe. That's true. I mean, you had to know that it was going to be successful. I mean, you know, the huh. NFL, they had to have known. Who, what stooges were telling you that was a bad move? <laughs> hey, by the way, you were legendary on SportsCenter, though, too, so I can understand – how that is something that happened. Right? No, I mean, again, NFL, well, it was an educated guess. Let's put it that way. Like if the NFL is going to say, we're going to start our own network and all 32 teams are popping in a nice chunk of change to get this thing launched. We were only on in direct TV and small cable. house. We were on in like 11, 12 million households going from ESPN to NFL network. I sliced to use a phrase that you used before. I sliced my platform by 10 X, like right off. Wow! Yeah, I, was, I do not know that. I'm doing Sports Center with Stuart Scott in front of 100 million people, and then now I'm doing NFL Total Access on a, on a network that was only in 10 million homes. That's it. Boom! Wow! I did not know that that was the way that people looked at that. Oh yeah. They, They're like, by, what are you doing? By the way, hey, hey, Rich. Yeah. Hey, thank you for making that leap. We love <laughs> NFL Network. Hey, it's thank got, you. No, I'm, but it's it. I'll, I'll tell this story. It's a great story. So you know, my wife was in Southern California before we moved out here because that's where NFL Network was. Because she was covering, you want to talk about, you know, uh, right place, right time too. She was covering LA sports when Reggie Bush was at USC and Shaq and Kobe Ooh. were winning championships and the Angels won the World Series. So she was locked into Los Angeles. And the first, uh, you know, winter we were here in 04 because NFL Network started in 03. She had us going to every single NBA All-Star Game party. Somebody comes up to me, says, I watch you every day. I'm like, really? You get NFL Network? Because we were only on in 10 million homes. Guy says to me, no, I'm talking about Sports Center." He goes, what are you talking about? I'm like, I'm on NFL oh. Network now. They're like, you're not on ESPN anymore? Pause. And he leans into me, says, are you all right? Like, <laughs> he asked, like he asked me, are you okay? And I'm like, if you got a fucking mirror, I'll fog it up for you if you want. You know, like, I'm more than happy to do that. You know, I tried not to get all uptight but yeah so i was hearing a lot about that. i went on jimmy yeah. Kimmel. i went on kimmel's show to promote it and he told me on his show in front of the whole abc network audience that i would be back on sports center in six months wow you know and it's well, a funny man. late night moment and i know he's just being you know he, he's a sweetheart of a guy and it wasn't being rude but it kind of sticks I, you know what i mean it sticks hey i'm happy you made that leap I'm happy the NFL Network is what it is, and uh, yeah, I think I think you could obviously assume that I had uh, similar type situations. When I, even my mom and dad, a couple of times, there was a couple like, "Are we, are we a hundred percent sure?" I'm like, "I think so. I, I, I think so. I why? think it's the why right did, time." Why, like, why were you so sure? Why were you sure about that? So I got a chance 
you know, to kind of experience the off the field stuff that was happening while I was playing towards the end of my career. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a, a podcast I'd launched whenever I was playing. I'd done a stand up comedy tour while I was playing. I had a merch business while I was playing. I had pretty good social media stuff whenever I was playing. So in, in the stand up comedy, I rented out the theaters and sold the tickets myself on my Twitter account. Yeah. Like, so like everything I did, I, I, I was kind of doing it myself. Took a lot of lumps, but I also got a chance to see that there's a, a there's a world outside of the NFL that is currently blossoming, which is the uh, the internet. You know, it's the modern day gold rush or whatever. Even more so than whenever I was going. So, I just with another knee surgery, I wasn't necessarily loved by the regime. You know, that was kind of there at the end. So uh-huh. I didn't necessarily love going into work anymore. I was really enjoying and getting fulfillment out of what I was doing off the field, whether it was all that shit or the foundation stuff that I got to do. It was just, I had taken care of everybody already financially in my circle. I'd gotten everybody back, you know, to zero or, you know, in the green, as opposed to out of debt. I feel like I hit the reset button for a lot of people. It just, and with the opportunity, I was going to create my own app because I had a pretty loyal fan base in Indiana and parts of the Midwest that would, you know, rock with me with whatever. I mean, the first time I went on stage, it was in front of like 2,800 people or whatever. The ticket sold out in six seconds. So it was like I had a really loyal crew of people that were following me. And I'm so, so lucky for that. I have no idea why. I think they enjoy seeing the idiot do things. But I appreciate the hell out of him. So I, I just felt like retiring. I was, I was going to retire a year before I did. Mm-hmm. Chuck and I took a trip to Japan uh, for USO. And we kind of had, you know, in a 17-hour flight, you have some conversations. I come back. And then I just had the same feeling again. And I was going to start my own app. And I was going to charge like a monthly subscription, like a buck, buck 99. And I was doing the math on how many people I thought would potentially get that. And then Portnoy and Erica heard about that over a bar stool. And Dave reached out to me. And Dave has been somebody that's obviously utilized the Internet as a business and kind of set the staple of how to kind of run an Internet business alongside Rogan and a few others have really uh, done it well. And he said, he said, you know, I hear what you want to do or whatever. Let us just kind of help you through this process, kind of educate you a little bit on how the Internet works a little bit more. And I didn't want to move to New York. I stayed in Indianapolis, ran my own thing. And then when it came time to kind of separate, I feel like, you know, I kind of went through a quick Ivy League school of how to work the business. Plus, with my own experience, it was just the timing felt 100 percent right for me. And whenever when I chose to retire. And there was a lot of people talking, you know, Will Bond. There's that infamous clip where Will Bond basically is saying, I have no friends because my friends should be holding my uniform on me and forcing me back. I just made a Pro Bowl. So I appreciate the right. amount of respect everybody had for me. But I didn't even want to I didn't want to pick up a football after I retired. I didn't want to look at a field for like six months to a year because I wanted people to know that, like, I made the decision with conviction. I feel like I can be successful here. To your point, if I'm not successful here, everybody's here is going to say I'm an idiot. And I shouldn't have retired and I wasted years. So I got real stubborn. I got real stubborn on making this work, uh, grinding out as much as I could alongside my team. And, uh, yeah, it's just like it's nice to go out and kick a ball every once in a while knowing that it's not just uh, I'm going to definitely go back. It's just like I enjoy doing it now. So it's uh, it's been a cool ride for sure. But the Kobe – chips on his shoulder is definitely a real thing in everything that I do. There's no question about it, Pat. And I'll say this, you know, as we, we realm and, you know, just linger in this a bit and then just, uh, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up with you here. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm serious when I say this, like my, my show, uh, went through a lot of changes this past year. And that's what a lot of this podcast is about. I've been sharing a lot of these stories and all, you know, and I, you know, uh, when I saw you at the combine in 2020, when I appeared on your show, Um, you know, and I was wondering what the hell was I going to do without the, the network, you know, AT&T that was owning my show for all that time. And they informed me two days before Christmas that Dan Patrick and I would have to find a new home. And I was wondering what, what I was going to do. And, um, you know who I reached out to? I reached out to you. And I saw your uh, no, and I saw your operation firsthand. And I just kind of want everyone to know this because you make it look easy. You're funny, you know, and you show up in your tank tops, which you know I'll never be able to do. And you stand there with your baseball bat, and you have conversations with your boys that mimic and are something that uh, you know normal regular people have. 
And it's also aspirational where regular people want to be part of your world. Okay. They want to laugh with you. And it's really natural, but it is a shit ton of hard work, what you are doing. The fact that you add the WWE on it, and I know that you, you know, you jump in top rope and you're having fun, but that's work. <laughs> I mean, no, no, seriously, you're, 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 you're working your ass off and your Thank audience you. is following you. And this is a serious business that you've grown. And that's a fact, you know, and I'm, I'm, it's, it's a true fact. And I don't know, man, you got a, a ton of energy. I mean, I know you did three hours and then your pod and now you're talking to me right now. God bless you. Uh, I mean, it's a serious reserve that you have, Pat. That's a fact. Well, I appreciate that, Rich. That means a lot. And when I got, you know, really schooled to the game of the internet, I think after I retired and I realized like, oh, I'm going to be, I'm going to be working like, you know, back to the number, probably 10 X what I would do if I was in the NFL, but giving a chance to do it with my boys, you know, my team, getting a chance to kind of, live out these incredible opportunities like working with the wwe i mean i main evented a wwe pay-per-view and that is just outrageous it was in the middle of football season it was just an opportunity that if i don't do i gotta be the dumbest human of all time but when i was in the nfl and i and i talked about getting a chance to do a lot of things the bob and tom show which is a morning radio show that's been syndicated across america on FM AM channels for like 30 some years at this point, they allowed me to come in and kind of watch the way they operate and being successful as a radio show for that long, especially with a group of people who, you know, especially at the wake up at three 30 in the morning and everything like that. It was very cool to learn from them. Tom Griswold told me something. Tom Griswold told me something hilarious. And it was one morning, I forget, somebody was given an answer about something and I like, well, you got a feel for him or whatever. And then like kind of moved on during the commercial break, Tom looked at me and he goes, he goes, hey, Pat, just something to think about. He said, the people that listen to the show, and he wasn't talking about me, he was talking about somebody else to talk. The people that listen to the show, they got enough shit. They got enough shit going on, all right? Just entertain them and just keep it moving. Like that is, that is what we do. That is what we're trying to do. We're trying to be a mental vacation. So the thought of, you know, ever saying no or ever being down or not being like full go, like that has never crossed my mind. Cause it's like, if people spend their time watching or listening to our shit, like I want them to know I'm going all in. Like I am all in every single time. I will say I'm going to get burnt out at some point, but I enjoy everything I do right now. So I assume, I assume that that crash will come rich. Yeah. And I appreciate, I appreciate the shout out for That's the hard true. work, but I enjoy everything right now so, so much. Yeah, and the WWE, that, that seems like a natural fit for you and a natural extension for you. And it's a, the zenith of pop culture popularity right now. And, you know, I think it dovetails into your audience and your audience into that. I mean, it is kind of a natural that you're doing. You, you must be pinching yourself doing that, certainly now for Fox on Friday nights, Pat. Yeah, it's insane. You know, I'm sitting next to Michael Cole. I got Vince McMahon dropping into my ear via headset, like an actual voice of God. What do you mean? What's it? He's getting in. Yeah, so when you Yes, yeah, so when you're a commentator with the WWE, since you know it's Vince McMahon's company and yeah. Vince McMahon used to be a commentator and he's still hands on with everything, like if something changes with the show or something, he'll come in and say, like, to the commentators who are telling the story, you know, the commentator's job, there's a real job yeah. to the commentating and Michael Cole is un believable at what he does Syracuse grad he is an unbelievable talent at what he does because he has to direct and call and everything like that but yeah this past Friday night Smackdown was my first time with Vince McMahon in the building and all of a sudden out of nowhere just boom voice of God's in there and I like sat up and I'm like oh my god here we go but like I'm getting a chance to hear a billionaire's brain spill through his mouth into my ear while talking about his product that he created that has become a global phenomenal it was just it was one of those moments where i'm like this is the dumbest life of all time i should not be here but let's enjoy the ride while we have it you know it's just really cool stuff rich and i can't say this enough i cannot say this enough i said it earlier you laughed it off when you invited me to do the rich eisen podcast i flew out to la strictly for that i thought it was the coolest thing of all time i was so thankful for the opportunity you've been a massive part of everything I've done for the long haul, and I appreciate the hell out of you. All right, right back at you, Pat. I always you 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 had me at hello, literally, and then when you know I I had I had my show and <clears throat> that I started seven years ago, and then you'd come out and do an hour, 
And I would see your popularity based on the responses that I would get from my audience as well. And obviously, you're, you're doing it every day on your YouTube stream and everything else outside of all that. And I did see uh, the other day you uh, talking about, um, I guess, and we'll finish this up, a snub, uh, an Emmy Award snub for the Pat McAfee show and you. Um, you know, I saw that. Rich. Pat. I saw that. Rich. Yeah. You know. Like Dan Patrick, OG, you know, you, OG in there. Good morning, football. I love good morning, football. Okay, Sports Center's been around a long time. There's a couple yeah. daily shows, though, that I think, like, you know, I'm going three and a half hours every single day. My sure. boys at least deserve a little bit of a nod here. I think we, you know, in our stats and analytics on the back end of YouTube, we could show and say, hey, we're doing something. But yeah. what we did learn is you got to, you got to, uh, you got to nominate yourself. Yes, we, you uh, have to put a reel in. Pat. Did you not yeah, do yeah. that? No, 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 absolutely not. We didn't even know. We did not even know that these sports Emmys existed, uh, Rich. So a process, Pat. Yeah, it's our fault. It's there, our fault. This is, is one of those process. things, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is one of those things. Whenever you're, you know, you're independent in Indiana, you can get miss out on some things, you know. So we were a little bit upset with some people. We shouldn't have been upset with. It is our fault, but to each their own. It's another day. It's another day, Rich. Another Live day. and learn. Yeah, you got it. You have to put in a submission. Um, yeah. For it, they don't just come find you. Um, despite your immense popularity, Pat, you still have to. No, you know, no, 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 no. We just process. thought. We just yeah. thought maybe there was you know, a couple overlords that are just watching everything, right. making these decisions. And then the news was broken to us that, you know, no, no, you have to, you have to actually, they actually, you know, somebody actually reached out to us and was like, can you put together a four-year consideration maybe for this? Yes. Thing? It's like, sorry, we don't know the biz. We don't know the biz. Well, here's what you also year. have to do, Pat. And this will be in a way just a, my, my latest, um, you know, thank you for doing this. And then the ultimate, you're welcome on this process is that the way this works is you put in a submission and the people who watch it are all supplied by the networks. Okay. Now you're not supposed to be able to review anything that involves your network, but you kind of pack the court in a way. So you've got to put a submission in and then you've got to have some of your staff review other people's material. And then you get part of the system and boom, the Pat McAfee show becomes Emmy nominated. And so does Pat McAfee for host. And then you show up hopefully post pandemic and totally wreck the place. Like you did at the draft and announcing the Colts pick and just rule the universe and make your mark that way, Pat in making a, an acceptance speech for the generations to behold. That's the plan. That's the master plan. It, it seems like that's a lot of work. Okay. It seems like that's a lot of work. We'll, we'll get to that. But I think what we landed on before knowing that we had to potentially nominate ourselves is I'm just going to go to that uh, bald dude from Pawn Stars and just buy one. <laughs> I'm just going to buy one and just say, you know what? We earned it. We did it. And uh, just kind of move on. I'm thinking about doing that with a Super Bowl ring since Drew Brees and his dumb baby, you know, won that game, uh, my rookie here. So. You know, if you can't earn it, buy it. You got to do what you got to do, Rich. Pat, it's called growing. It's called growing, and obviously you just keep growing, and uh, I really appreciate you coming on this pod, man. You're, uh, you're like I said, one of my favorites, and anytime. I know we want to do a home-and-home home, uh, for the show once I get my uh, my visual technology up and running. We'll do it. We'll do it. We got to figure that out. We got to figure out how to do that. It, there has to be a way that we can FaceTime each other and be live at the same time. Has any show done that? Has any show done like a home and home at the same time live for like so. an hour? I think we, I think we got to do it. D does that mean like AJ Hawk, I got to smoke a cigar during the conversation? Cause that, I don't know if that would really work for me, but we could just. Hey, his ventilator broke today. His, uh, his, uh, his fan broke today. He, it actually started whistling because he blows 10 <laughs> cigars through that thing it's i've never seen anything like it have you ever seen somebody smoke that many cigars in your life uh, no. I, I don't think i ever had it's unbelievable hey but uh, don't mess with the system don't mess hey with you the bring system. your own device by the way okay. whatever you need you can you can do that for ours and and uh, hopefully we don't ruin your show we got to remember fcc on your show right yeah pretty much i think so yeah we're on terrestrial yeah, we'll radio. remember that we'll, we'll have to remind everybody of that Pat, we should got, do that well i'd love to i would absolutely love it thanks for doing this though pat i really appreciate it brother Thank you, man. What's the name of this thing? The it's beginning? It's called Just Getting Started right there. It's, I even got like a little bit of a...
piece of wood panel oh, like right a, there. It's called branding. Oh, is that a, it's is it a paddle or a, it's a, a paddle. low? Yeah. It's a paddle. Is it because you're paddling the competition? That is correct. I just take everybody's competition and just like take that roam. You know, like just that's the way I do it. You know, that's the way I roll. <laughs> Hilarious. You're the man, Pat. Hilarious. Pat McAfee show every day on uh, the uh, highly popular YouTube stream for Pat McAfee, 12 to 3 Eastern, what, WWE, Friday nights on Fox and your podcast network. And uh, congrats on everything, bud. Appreciate it. Yeah, and I appreciate you plugging it. But to be honest, it's not worth it. Listen to Rich's stuff. <laughs> Rich Eisen's live every day on Peacock and Westwood radio stations across the country. That's where I would spend my time if I were you. But I appreciate the time you're invading people's brains that have probably never heard of me before. Pat McAfee, everybody here on Just Getting Started. Man, I love Pat. He just only knows one speed, and it is just uh, it is just so much fun. He is so funny. He is so funny, and people just flock to his uh, style of broadcasting, and um, I'm glad that he joined us on this draft week where so many uh, so many stars are born and so many careers are started and so many careers that people think are going to get started the way that they hoped would get started aren't started that way, and they have to be a self-starter because they're free agents. And Pat was almost an undrafted free agent. We all know what opportunities came his way with Indianapolis and what he's he's made of them. And I'm serious. I'll just tell you again, um, because I share as much as I possibly can here on this show. And I got to meet Pat through my Punters or People 2 campaign. I'm wearing the T-shirt that I had made up through through my my show merchandise store. Um, And, um, you know, that that show merchandise store that this was in was was through DirecTV and AT&T, who supported my show, uh, helped birth it in 2014. And then I got a call two days before Christmas in 2019 to say that their, uh, the audience channel was going to be shuttered. And my show, along with Dan Patrick's, that had been on audience for all those years, Dan's been on audience much longer than mine, uh, would have to find new homes. And that everything was moving to their streamer that AT&T was uh, owning and operating, HBO Max. And HBO Max didn't have a live portal. And even if they did, they didn't think that my show would fit their business model. And I had to go find a new home for it. And the clock was ticking. The clock was ticking. And my, 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 my show that I put so much sweat equity into um, was on life support. And the pandemic was about to hit. And I'm in Indianapolis for the Combine. And I saw what Pat was doing with YouTube. And I knew that was going to be my first home. Uh, once that I got home from the combine is when my, my time with audience and the audience network was over. I said, farewell. I signed off of audience network before I took that flight to the combine in Indianapolis in 2020. And I knew I would have to go on YouTube and I knew Pat knew the, the medium. Well, I went on Pat's show at the combine cause he's, he emanates from his own studio in Indianapolis and I saw his operation and I said, walk me through how it works with YouTube. How does it work? What do you do to game the system? How do you get your algorithm up? What are the ins and outs of making this a successful business? And he shared it all with me. He shared it all. And again, I know the guy that you see on the air, uh, the guy that you you see, and you know, talk in very plain language. You see the guy that wears his tank top and is, you know is standing up with his microphone, holding a bat, holding a, a hockey stick. Doesn't look traditional, and it's not traditional media. But what the guy does is he works his ass off, talking three hours a day, growing a business, talking to subscribers, talk, talking to distribu- distribution partners to make it bigger, talking to advertisers, talking to people who want to tap into his world. And I reached out to him and he gave me some two cents. And I went from YouTube beginner to growing it and reaching out to NBC Sports and getting a deal with them and NBC SN for just the spring and the summer and then went from there to Peacock and went from there to where I am today. Partners with Westwood One, partners with Sirius XM, partners with Odyssey, um, my first free streaming audio partner uh, that just started this week, growing it. And um, you know where I was one year ago at this time, getting ready for an NFL draft, uh, which I hosted digitally for their NFL Draftathon from this chair, from this seat that I am currently doing Just Get It Started, wondering where my show was going to go, wondering what was going to happen with my show, with, with the sports world. We were in the middle of a lockdown. Commissioner Roger Goodell was doing his draft. 
conducting his role in the NFL draft from his basement, from his Barker lounger, sitting there with his feet up, calling out picks, me wondering what the hell the football season was going to look like and where my show might be going. It was um, it was some wild times, and I did reach out to Pat for some help, and you could see what he's doing. It's uh, something I highly respect, and I wanted to bring his story to you here on Just Getting Started. If you are thinking about, hey, I've got an idea, I'm going to leave my job, or I, I feel like I'm not too happy with anymore, and I believe in a, a certain um, concept that I have, um, and it's not a traditional idea. If you are out there thinking maybe you could start your own show, there's YouTube. There's so many different ways for you to start it. And, you know, obviously Pat had uh, a successful career that uh, feathered his nest a little bit, but he also believed in self and just got started on something new. And I wanted him to tell his stories and I knew some of them would just be laugh out loud hilarious. So... That's it for this ninth episode of Just Getting Started. We'll reach double digits. And uh, we've got a lot of great fun guests in the hopper that uh, that are soon to be scheduled. We'll keep, uh, keep uh, you up to speed on all that. And just uh, do us a favor. Tell everyone about the pod. Subscribe to it if you already haven't. Hit us with a five-star rating. That would be wonderful, too. Signing off on this latest episode of Just Getting Started with Pat McAfee.